Hey guys, thanks to everyone who was able to make it out to the latest meetup. If you weren't able to make it, no big deal. Understand we all have things going on. I did want to cover some of the topics here just in case uh, so that if you meet us uh, at our next meetup, you haven't missed any uh, material. So I may move th through this a little bit quicker than I normally do, uh, mostly because, well, you can pause it and you can replay sections. Uh, and so I'm hoping this will be just as helpful as if you were at the meetup. Okay, so this is our second uh, intro course. So there's definitely some regular programming concepts in here mixed in with this is how we do it in Python. Okay, so if I uh, look over our topics, we did a quick review. Uh, we talked about the none type. Uh, we'll talk about what a traditional array is and then look at some of the container types because some of those traditional array concepts bleed into how we use them in Python. Okay, so again, just a little bit of a review. We talked about Python being an interpreted language, meaning that I don't have to first compile it with some other program. I essentially can just write some Python code in a text file and then execute it with Python. Okay, it's a high level language, meaning that uh, I don't necessarily have to get into the nitty gritty details of every data type that I'm storing and how many bytes is, is this data type versus how many bytes is that data type. There's a lot of that that's abstracted away uh, from me so that I can code really fast uh, and a little bit more efficiently. Um, but again, you lose a little bit of power uh, in some of those lower level languages. Um, or when you're programming in a higher level language. But the point is, is that you can do it really quickly um, and it's, it's easier to do on the programmer. Object oriented, meaning that everything we'll see in Python essentially has data about that thing and it has functions or methods that we can do uh, with it. So in the example we gave last week, it was a car. A car's data might be uh, how many wheels does it have? What type of engine does it have? How many seats does it have? How many doors does it have? But the methods that we'll see that we can interact with that object is I can drive it, I can start it, I can fill it with fuel, lots of different things, right? So we'll see that same thing in every object we touch in Python. And then lastly, it's dynamically typed, meaning I don't have to say, hey, when I store this data, I want you to store it as an integer. Python can pretty much figure out what I want, and there's only rare cases that I have to be very explicit in that way. Okay, uh, I'm going to breeze through these. We had integers, we had floats, the difference being floats have decimal points. We had complex numbers, we have strings that are uh, inside of quotes, and then we have Boolean values, which could be true or false values, right? This is an expansion of some of the operators that we saw uh, during the last one, so we definitely saw uh, addition, subtraction, multiplication, and division. But now we also see there's this floor or integer division. And where that comes into play is sometimes I don't care about a remainder, right? I just want to know what is the integer value once that division is performed. So the example that I gave, if I go to my terminal here, uh, I can bring up Python with Python 3 uh, on my machine. And let's say the price of something, uh, we I think we did Pokemon cards or something like that. So a pack of cards was $3.99. And I currently have $10, right? So I have these two variables. Pack represents the price of a pack of cards. And I have money, which represents how much money I currently have. And what I want to know is how many packs of cards can I afford? So we would think it'd be really easy just to do money divided by pack. And I would be like, well, I can buy two and a half packs of cards, right? Well, that makes sense in our minds, but maybe to a machine that half a pack of cards doesn't make a whole lot of sense. The store is not going to sell me a half a pack of cards. So I can't tell my program, hey, go ahead and order two and a half packs of cards. Instead, I can do money and do two slashes, and this time it returns to me just 2.0, okay? So now it my program knows, well, I can only afford two of them, so go ahead and order just two, right? So that integer division just drops off the decimal uh, portion of the number. 
We also saw modulus uh, during our meetup. So modulus is, is a weird one. It's almost the opposite of, you know, floor integer division. It drops off the integer portion and just keeps the remainder portion, right? Uh, and that's kind of a play on things. It's not really dropping the integer portion as much as it is when it performs the division, it keeps what's left over. Meaning in my case, um, let's say, uh, I did order this way. Well, money times 3.99. Oops, not money times 3. Dot, how about pack times 2.0? Uh, I'm really spending $7.98. And so there's a remainder portion because we started from $10. That's kind of important. Um, and while that's not truly how uh, the modulus is working where the modulus really comes into play is maybe I did have uh, something like 11 divided by five, right? So there, you know, five can't evenly divide into 11. And so this says, you know, 2.2. So it's going in two times, meaning that we're really looking at five times two, which is 10 and then 11 minus 10. So there's this one that is a remainder. So if I do 11% five, I get one back. And so this is referencing that remainder portion that's left over. And why this becomes important is there's times where maybe I want something as simple as I want to tell if something is an even or an odd number, right? And so uh, I could do 11% two, meaning I'm going to divide 11 by two. And if I get a one back, I knew I know that two didn't evenly divide in. So it's an odd number. Whereas if I do a 10% two, I get zero back because it evenly divided in, there's no remainder left. And therefore, I know this is an even number. Okay, so that's one place we may use a modulus. Another place is maybe to define a particular range of numbers, right? So for example, we haven't talked about loops yet, but I can have this loop structure called a for loop. And in Python, it looks like this for x. So x is a variable, I could even just do x var or for var, right? In and there's this thing called a range. And so this range is going to return to me uh, a range of numbers. The first uh, time through the loop, it's going to send me a zero. The second time through the loop, it's going to send me a one. And it'll go all the way up to, in this case, it's going to stop at 14. 14 is the last one it's going to give me. And when I get to the 15th one, it's going to exit out of the loop, right? So it's 15 total numbers that it gives me, but it starts at zero. So I get a, a range of numbers from zero to 14. So 15 total numbers, but zero to um, zero to 14. Okay. So what I can do with this is I could print and I could print uh, my var percent five. And what I should see coming out if I slide back up is the numbers that are actually printed out are 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. And then it starts back at 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. And then it goes back to 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. So everything stays within the 0 to 4 range. Well, why is that? Well, every number that comes into this loop, 0 the first time, then 1 the second time, and then 2 the second time, they are all getting divided by 5. But the thing that's getting printed out is just the remainder because I used the modulus operator. Okay, so the first time through zero uh, divided by five. Well, there's no remainder for that. Okay, now it's one divided by five. Well, five can't go into it, so it's a remainder of one. Then it's two divided by five. Well, five can't go into two, so it's a remainder of two. Well, it does that all the way up to the point where it gets to five, and then five divided by five. Well, five definitely divides into that. There's no remainder left over. And so you get a zero. Then it goes to six. Well, it evenly divides in with one left over, right? So there's a you know, remainder of one, so on and so forth. And so you see this pattern where it, I can now restrict the range of numbers I get from a specified range. It will only go up to uh, the point right before five. And then the sequence starts over. So again, 
you can end up using modulus quite a bit in you know the types of pro you know depending upon the type of program you're working with but that is the modulus it's one more tool in our toolbox okay now we also have the raise to the power of so the double asterisk there okay so if i want to raise something to the power of something else so five to the power of two is just five times five right so i get 25 back whereas five to the power of three this is five times five times five i get 125 right so you could see you know you can do different things like this and so where this might become useful depending upon the types of calculations you're doing um, it's easy to kind of see maybe the powers of two because as we start learning about the different numbering systems where decimal uh, that you're probably used to where we have from zero to nine the binary system only has zero and one. And so we'll talk more about those, um, but essentially it's the powers of two. So whereas in our normal uh, numbering system, maybe we had the number 523, right? Well, what is that actually composed of? This is actually uh, three to the power of 10, or three times uh, 10 to the power of zero is three plus well we can put this on a new line so it's easier to see and this is two times ten to the power of one and this is five times ten to the power of two and so what we see is this is three plus twenty plus five hundred makes up five hundred and twenty three so the pattern here is this is the zero column, this is a one column, and this is the two column. And because we're using the decimal system, there are 10 total digits from zero to nine that we could use in any one of these, right? But the position that they're in, so zero, one, and two, is where this power comes in. So 10 to the power of zero, uh, 10 to the power of one, 10 to the power of two, right? Well, the same thing holds for some of the other numbering systems. So there's a number system that we'll cover later that just has uh, uh, only two digits, so zero and one. And so we'll find out that maybe we had this number uh, 101 in binary actually equates to uh, one times 10 uh, to the or not 10, but two, because we only have two total digits we could use, to the power of zero plus one. Actually, that was zero times two to the power of one plus one uh, times two to the power of two. And what we find is in binary, one zero one actually equates to five in, in binary or in decimal, right? So, and we can even look at that. If I use the bin function, this converts to binary. So bin of five comes back as one zero one. But the point I wanted you to see is that this operator can raise things to the power of, and we may use that in different types of calculations, but we also might use that in converting between, you know, decimal and binary and, and, and so on. Okay, so another, another thing that uh, we have at our disposal. One thing I did want to point out too is we can make assignments, we can do different types of mathematical operations, but we can also combine that. Uh, Python lets us kind of shorten it a little bit. So instead of seeing uh, change, if I had this variable called change uh, and I wanted to add a nickel to my change, uh, I could do change equals change plus five, right? So I'm saying I had maybe 10 cents to begin with, I'm adding a nickel to it, I assign that back to change, now I have 15 cents. In this case, we can shorten that and we can just do change plus equals five and that does the same thing as change equals change plus five, okay? So we may see that from time to time. I tend to shorten a lot of my code in that respect. Um, so you may see that going forward. We also have different uh, operators here on the right where we can make comparisons. We have less than, less than or equal to, greater than, greater than or equal to. We have a double equals that actually compares two values. 
So I could have five uh, equals, oops, not that one, equals five, and I get true. But five does not, you know, obviously equal eight, so I get false. So if I use a single equals, that's an assignment. Whereas if I use the double equals, that's a comparison of values. Now there are other types of comparisons that we can do, one of which is this is keyword that's down here, right? So is actually tries to determine if they're the exact same object. So I mentioned that Python's an object-oriented language. Everything in Python is an object, right? So if I have this variable, and I'll call this my list1, and I'll say list1 is equal to, and I'm going to build a list. No, we haven't talked about lists yet, uh, but let's say, for instance, this list has one, two, and three in it, right? And then I create another list, list two equals, and I'll also say it has the exact same value. So one, comma, two, comma, three, right? So I now have these two lists, list one and list two, and they look exactly the same. But I could say list one is list two, and it'll say false. And that's because they're actually two separate objects. They happen to have the same values assigned to them, but they're two totally different objects. And I know that because there's this ID function that I can run, and it will print out the memory address where this uh, object actually lives, right? So where it is actually stored. And so if I do that for list two, what I'll see is all the numbers are different. So we can see 40928, 38656. So they're stored in two totally different places. So when I use the is keyword, it's actually going to see, do these reference the same points in memory? They don't, so they're different objects. So although they hold the same value, they're different objects, right? Okay, so there's the double equals that's definitely gonna do a comparison of values, and then there's is, which will compare the addresses of those objects to see if they point to the same object, all right? Okay, let's close that out. Okay, now as we're doing comparisons, sometimes we wanna uh, basically perform more than one comparison at the same time or we want to chain comparisons together, right? So there is an or and an and that we might see, right? So this or and and. So or will say if either one of them are true, if I'm chaining two different uh, comparisons together, if either one of them are true, my, my result will be true. And is a little bit different. Both sides have to be true Otherwise, the entire thing becomes false, okay? And I can kind of see that when I do some like Boolean comparison. So I could do a five is greater than six and that would return you know, a Boolean value. I'm just gonna jump right to the Boolean value because it'll be a little bit easier for you to see. So I could do true or false. And I should get true back because with or, as long as one of the sides is true, I'll get a true back. Whereas if I do true and false, I'm going to get false because both sides have to be true, right? So I can do a true and true, and in fact, it works. I can do a false, oops, false and false, and I get false back. If I do a false or false, I get false back as well because neither one of those sides. And I can do a false or true or true or true, and it works as I expect it to, right? So again, or is one of the sides, at least one of the sides has to be true. With and, both of them have to be true. And so uh, I think one of the examples that, that was used uh, is that maybe uh, I wanna buy a TV. When the TV has to be less than $500, but the diameter of the TV has to be greater than 56 inch or something, right? So that's a comparison. First, I have to compare to see, is the price of the TV less than 500? So I could say, if my price equaled 499, say price, uh, and we could say the dimensions uh, are 56 inch, right? So the price 
uh, must be less than or equal to 500. And I know that's true. And my dimensions has to be greater than or equal to um, 56. Okay, and so that works, right? But if I were to say that, nah, 56 is too small for me, it really needs to be a 60 inch TV. Well, in this case, this TV uh, wouldn't fit that kind of thing. Although it was the correct price, its dimensions was wrong. And so the and is looking for, are both sides of my comparisons true? If not, I'm gonna return false, okay? So those are kind of some of our comparison operators uh, that we'll see uh, we use quite a bit. Now, none type is something a little bit different in Python. Some of the other programming languages, they, they need a way to represent nothing, essentially no value. So in C, we would see something like null. A null value means nothing. Well, in Python, we call that none and its type, just like you had integer as a type and just like you had float as a type, the nuns type is none type, okay? And so we'll see this from time to time. If a function doesn't return a value to us, it typically actually just returns none. And so we may see none get assigned to one of our variables. So we'll say our result equals none. Oops, and I mistype. How about none, okay? Now, the proper way of checking to see if the value of result is none is using the is keyword. So result is none, okay? And so that's typically the way we'll do that comparison. Now, we could do the double equals and that returns you know, true in this case, but the proper way of checking it is with the is keyword, okay? Because essentially result will point to none. And so the ID of result and the ID of none is the same. They're pointing to the same place. And so the proper way of checking, you know, if a result is none is to use the is keyword, okay? So that's our none type. We may see it from time to time when something didn't return a value, okay? And maybe sometimes it's a default value. So unless we change it, it's none, right? Okay, so arrays. So we need a way of being able to store multiple values. Whereas before we were storing like in this result variable, we just had a single thing, none. Or in our price, we had a single thing, 3.99, you know, whatever it was. There are times where we want to store multiple values. Uh, so one of the examples we used uh, quite a bit in this meetup was testing, right? So a class is given a test, each student takes the test, each student receives a grade. And so the teacher needs a way to store all of those grades she may store it or he may store it in a, some type of an array, right? And so these are stored in memory right next to each other. And they it's done that way because it's really efficient for the computer to then look up those values because it knows, you know, if I know where the array starts, I can calculate where all of the different values are in that array. And that brings up an interesting, uh, you know, uh, point is that we'll see that we reference those individual values by th something called an index value. On here, it's called an indice, right? But it's an index value. And that can throw some issues because if you're not used to programming, you think, well, we always start at one uh, and count from there. But in computers, we start at zero and we count up from there. And the reason for that, if I can, hopefully this will work, um, the reason for that is that when we reference a memory address for our array, it's really starting right here, right? So it's starting right there. So this is a memory address. So if we said our array is variable one, whatever, whatever name we gave it, it's actually referencing a memory address right here at the beginning of our array. And the way that it's going to calculate where each of these different values are is it it's based on the data type that's stored there, right? So each data type in you know classical 
your computers has uh, a a size associated with it. So in this case, I'm using size of, which is kind of like a C kind of thing. But let's say, for instance, these are all integers. And in uh, this program, an integer is four bytes, right? So four bytes. And so if we look then, and let's say I wanted to reference this spot right here, it all the computer knows is where this start is. And it knows that the data type stored in here is four bytes long. So it's going to say, okay, well, if you want index number two, I'm going to say, I'm going to say the memory address. So memory plus four times the index. And so then what this ends up becoming is four times two. So that becomes eight. So it's going to take this memory address, add eight to it, and it knows to then move uh, eight bytes from there over, and it will end up right at the start here of this one. So when I read or write, it's going to put it right in this portion of the array. And this is why we have to start with zero, because in this case, if I erase all my stuff here, what we actually have is our memory address plus four bytes times zero. And so we essentially just end up at our memory address. And so we end up right here, okay? And so it by using zero index values, we know we'll be at the start of our array. And if we do one, then we're adding four into it, which puts us over here, okay? So th that's traditional arrays as you might see it in other programming languages. All values are stored right next to each other. We start them at index value zero um, and then everything is calculated from there. Now, what we can run into is a programmer forgets that we start at zero. And so that programmer knows I stored five total values here. I stored five total values in my array. So if I want the last value, I should be looking for index five, right? Because five total values, index five. And that makes a mistake in that they start from here and then it calculates five times four bytes. And what it actually ends up with is it hits right here. And the value now you're looking at is something beyond the end of our actual array. And so we cause problems. It either causes uh, uh, our program to crash, it causes you know something to leak, uh, it causes a vulnerability in our program that some hacker can exploit. So it causes real problems. And this happens all the time in computer programming, all the time, right? It's just this little bit of a mistake causes a, a, a big issue. And that's all because these start at zero and you know, people are you know programming re really quickly and they make a mistake and now we've moved beyond the end of the array, okay? So some programming languages will let you do that and well, your program's gonna have some problems. Python tries to help you out um, and tries to make sure that you can't do those things, um, but we still need to be aware of them, okay? So if I, hopefully, I, nope, I've still got that up. Let me turn that off. And so we have these container types, just like there was the array in traditional uh, programming. In Python, we call this a list or a tuple or a set or a dictionary, ways of storing multiple values. So we'll find that a list is very similar to an array, uh, but because it's an object itself, we have lots of methods that we can use with our list. So again, a list uh, is something that's gonna store multiple values, tuple, is stores multiple values, but you can't change it. Sets allow us to store unique values, uh, and then we can compare and contrast them with other sets. Uh, and then a dictionary is gonna allow us to store things in key value pairs, and so we'll see that. I'm gonna breeze through tuples and sets just because they're not used as much as lists and dictionaries, especially as you first start programming. But sets and stuff like that become handy uh, from time to time.
okay? So a list allows you to store multiple items of varying data types, meaning that I could store, uh, I could store integers, uh, floats, strings, other lists, other objects, all in the same list, right? Um, and so Python just makes that work under the hood. Now, a uh, list is also ordered, meaning that the order that I put things into the list, it will stay that way, right? Unless I want it to change. And then just like our traditional arrays, lists are zero indexed, meaning if I want the very first item in the list, I need to use the zero index value. Okay, so what does it look like when we create a list? So uh, there's different ways of creating a list. Uh, the first one here, I use the list kind of function here and it returns an empty list. So my list equals list. Now uh, my list will have an empty list. Whereas in the second one here, I could say movies equals and I use these square brackets and the square brackets indicate that what I'm building is a list. And so in this case, I'm storing uh, three different strings, one called soul, one called son of Bigfoot, and one called Tom and Jerry. Then if I want to reference uh, one of those values, I still use that bracket index, uh, brackets right next to movies here. And I say index one. And so what I get is this son of Bigfoot. So let's look to see what that kind of looks like. So if I want uh, movies, and I could say, uh, what did we have? We had soul. I think these are mostly uh, newer movies here. We have son of Bigfoot, son of Bigfoot. And then what did I have? I had Tom and Jerry. Tom and Jerry, right? And so now I have this thing called movies and it is a list. So if I look at its type, it's a list, right? And if I want to reference any one of the values, I can have movies. You can use the bracket syntax. Uh, zero index is the first one, right? So I get soul, then one, I get son of Bigfoot, and then two, I get Tom and Jerry, okay? But I told you everything in Python is an object, right? So if I use the dir uh, inside of the Python REPL here, I can look to see what are the different methods that I could potentially use. And so I pointed out in the slides a couple of the more uh, useful ones that you'll see used quite a bit, like append. So if I had another movie uh, that I wanted, so uh, movies, and the way that I access these methods is with the dot syntax. So uh, append, and what do I want to append? I could do Goonies, right? So Goonies was a popular movie when I was growing up. So now when I look, I have my movies and now Goonies is at the end, right? And so it allows me to add things to my list. I can just keep appending things to the end of my list, right? What if I wanted to pull something out of my list? I can do movies.pop and pop by default is just gonna pull the last item out of my list. And so by popping, I'm pulling off the end of the list, which is Goonies. So now if I look at my list again, it no longer has Goonies in it, right? And so there's all these different methods that I can use. So we just did append and we did pop, but we also have insert, remove, sort. Um, and so those are gonna allow us to kind of manipulate the list. Now, as you're following along, I would I would uh, ask that you go in and play around with these different methods because again, you're gonna use them quite a bit. But just as importantly, go look at the help documentation for them. So insert, if I wanted to insert an item into the list, how do I use the insert method for a list? So if I go back to the REPL, I can do movie or I can do a help on movies.insert. And so it'll give me some documentation that essentially says, with insert, I need to specify an index value, right? So this is where I want it to be inserted into my list. And then the thing that I want inserted into my list. So some type of object, right? 
So let's say uh, I want to go back and put Goonies back in my list, but I want it to be uh, before Tom and Jerry, not after. All right, so I could do movies, insert, what's the index value? So we start at zero, one, two. So I want it to be at index two, and I'll say Goonies. All right, so now when I look at movies, I now have Goonies in index two position, right? Everything that was beyond that just slid to the right, okay? So again, use that help uh, inside of, of uh, the REPL to look at the documentation so that you know how to use those methods correctly, okay? And so then we could remove an item from the list and I'll leave that one to you to go and look at the documentation, to figure out how to use it, what are the particulars. I will say that remove, when you read some of that documentation, it says, hey, I'm only gonna remove the first occurrence of something. So if I had multiple Goonies in my list, so I could, if I arrow back up to where I had um, appended Goonies, and now I look at movies again, I in fact have two different Goonies now, right? So I have the string Goonies here, and I have the one I just appended. So if I were to do a remove, it's going to only, you know, grab the first one, right? Now, there's a way for me to look to see if a certain value is in uh, in my list. So there's the in keyword. So I could do Goonies in movies, and I will in fact get a true. Uh, but if I did uh, any of the Marvel movies, we'll just call it Marvel. Well, that's not in my list, right? So there's quick ways of searching through my list. <laughs> using that in keyword, right? So that's lists. Lists allow you to put multiple things in. Doesn't matter if it strings in this case. I could have appended any data type I wanted. I could append a five. And when I look at movies, five is at the end of my list, right? Uh, and so you can't really see that. I'm just noticing that. There you go. Okay. So I can put any data type I want, you know, as long as it makes sense. Now this last method I will point out to you is sort. Sort's a little bit different than some of the other ones. Sort will do an in place sort. So if I do movies.sort, doesn't, uh, oh, this is probably because I have both integers and strings. So Python can't quite figure out how I want it sorted because it doesn't really make sense to it. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to do movies.pop to get that five back out. So now I should only have strings in my list and we'll do movies.sort. Now when I look at it, what I'll see is that it's now in alphabetical order. Now, if these were all integers, they might be in integer order, you know, ascending order. But one of the things I can look at is uh, in my sort method, and I could do it movies.sort or I could do list.sort. Either way, it's going to send me uh, to the same things, but I can use a keyword argument called reverse. And so sometimes there's these keyword arguments that have a default value already assigned to them. In this case, reverse is set to false, which means it's always going to put it in ascending order. But what happens if I were to go back to sort and I'll put reverse equals true. And so when I look at movies again, I'll notice that it's now uh, no longer in alphabetical order. It's been reversed from alphabetical. Okay. So again, use the help documentation. It's there uh, for you. Whenever I write a, a Python program, I'm writing in one window and I have the REPL open in another one so that I can look at the documentation. Okay, so that's lists. Real easy to throw objects in there, manipulate them, do whatever you need, pull items in and out of it. Um, so super useful, okay? The next one is a tuple. And tuples are kind of like lists where they're stored, you know, uh, you can look at them using index values. The difference is, is that you can't manipulate them once you uh, create them. And that might be useful because if I'm returning something from a function, but I want to return multiple things, I can return it as a tuple. Uh, and I'm not expecting, you know, 
that tuple to be updated afterwards, right? Because that's a return value or something. Um, more or less what you may end up seeing them used for as well is maybe I have uh, something that I want to have available to me that I don't want it to change throughout the life of my program. So for instance, uh, one of the examples I used was the days of the week. So I might have a tuple that does Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. I don't want those names to change, so I may store them in a tuple so that they can't be updated, right? So I could do days equals, and instead of using square brackets, we use round brackets. And I'll say this one is Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and so on and so forth, right? So I can still access them with their index value, just like I did before. But one of the things I can't do is make an assignment to it. So whereas in my list, I could have changed these. In my tuple, I can't make this Friday. It's going to tell me, hey, object does not support item assignment, right? So again, I can create the tuple. I just can't update it. So when I do a dir on my tuple, and I could just say tuple, or I could say the name of days, you know, in this case. But either way, notice here, I don't have append, I don't have pop, I don't have sort, I don't have any of those other methods that we saw with the list, because again, a tuple's not expecting that you're going to change it. It's not meant to, right? Um, and one of the things I didn't show you with a list, but it holds true for a tuple as well, we have this thing called len, and I can say this is my days, and although it's supposed to represent the days of the week. I only actually stored three of them. So the value I get back out is three. There are three items stored in this days. When I had my movies, I could do a len on that as well. And again, it returns me five because I stored five different movies. Okay, so there's various functions that can take things like tuples and it can take things like lists uh, and it, it's happy to, to, to you know, work with them. Additionally, because we're working with index values, uh, well, we can do it with days. Since we know days has three items in it, if I were to have gotten the index value wrong because I started at one instead of starting at zero, which is correct for a computer, I'm going to get a index out of range. And the same thing holds true uh, if I was working with my movies. Our movies had five total items, so it should be zero, one, two, three, four. But I'm trying to grab uh, index five. I get a list index at a range. So they're both pointing, or the, the error is pointing out the same thing. It's an index error. You gave me an invalid index value. Uh, my program's going to crash right here unless I handle that exception. We call them exceptions in Python, right? But the point is, is that I can... I can use tuples very much like I can use a list. It's just I can't update them. I'm going to run into the same constraints with index values as I did with lists. I can hand a tuple to the len function, and it's happy to work with that. But, but I just can't update a tuple. And so in the case of our days of the week, that makes absolute sense. The days of the week, the names of them don't change. Okay. So our tuples... Just pointing out uh, in this one that a tuple can be created with just those round brackets or it can be created with the tuple function right there, right? I can have a tuple inside of my tuple. So in this example, cards is a tuple. So we see uh, if I try to draw this, if I notice here, I have a bracket and I have a bracket. So this is the outer tuple. And then inside of that, there's this one, which is a tuple. And then we have the comma, which this is our next value, which is a tuple. And then our comma, and then our next group. And that's a tuple as well. So just like a list, I can store different data types in it, and it's happy to take it. The point is, is I just can't change those things later on, right? 
And so again, in this case, I have a tuple of tuples. Uh, I can pull out, uh, or I can use the len uh, function on it. I can pull out individual values using their uh, index value. And this one, this one gets a little bit more complicated, but essentially when I did index value zero, I got this first tuple. And because I can also use index values on that tuple by stacking them together, I can access now this 13. So the first zero grabbed this tuple and then the one grabbed this, right? So again, you can stack these up if you're combining, you know, tuples in tuples or a list inside of a tuple. There's lots of different things that you can kind of do, right? Um, and let me make sure that I didn't just misspeak there. I'm fairly certain, I'm almost certain. Let's do a test here. Uh, we'll have a tuple and inside of that, I wanna try to have a list and we'll combine that. And it's happy to take that. So I can look at test zero and it'll pull out the list and then I can stack it up. And if I do another zero, I'll get the first item of my list. If I do one here, I'll get the second item, right? Okay. So that's tuples. We have sets, sets are a way for us to also store multiple items, but it's to store multiple unique items, okay? Order's not preserved, so the order that I put things into the set, there's no guarantee that it will stay that way. And there's no such thing as an index value with sets, right? And so what this might look like is a set, I'm gonna put things in there. So in this case, uh, in this case, uh, I did, let me move my mouse out of the way. <clears throat> I stored Maryland twice, okay? Well, because they have to be unique items, what I actually get in my list is only a single Maryland. I don't get two Marylands. Just like in our uh, list, we could have put, we put Goonies twice in it. That doesn't apply to the, the set. The set is only gonna take unique items. It already had a Maryland, so the second one just gets dropped, okay? And then in the second one, I made another set with Maryland as well. So this is a totally different set. This was uh, States 1, this is States 2. And then I also have New York. And the thing I want you to see with here is I can do a union. A union basically is a, it combines two sets together. So I had States 1 and I'm doing a union with State 2. And so I get Maryland, New York, and Georgia. So Maryland, New York, and Georgia. So these are all the values between them. But again, a set is unique items. So I don't get Maryland multiple times. I just get Maryland once, New York once, and Georgia. So these are all the values between the two sets. Now I also have an intersection. So in the intersection, it's which items exist in both lists. Well, I had Maryland in my first list and I had Maryland in my, or not list, in my first set, and then I have Maryland in my second set, so that's an intersection, and so I get Maryland as my output, all right? And then the, there's a difference which says, hey, what is an item in states one that does not exist in state two? So where do they not overlap? Um, and so in states one, we have Georgia, okay? but Georgia doesn't exist in states two, and so that's what I get for an output. Now, if I were to reverse this where I had states two dot difference, and it's doing a difference with states one, I should expect to see New York come out because again, it exists in state two, but it doesn't exist in state one. So it depends what you're making the, or where you're starting. So in this case, I'm starting with states one and comparing to states two, right? So again, I'm not gonna dig into this any more than I already have, uh, just because at this point, we're not gonna see a, a big use for sets, but as, move, as we move forward, we'll find that sets uh, may come in super handy. So recently, I did a Python program that had to, uh, it had to be able to figure out a maze. So everybody has done like the maze where you start at one corner and you have to figure out how to get all the way to the other corner and you keep running into roadblocks and stuff like that. Well, you can have a, a program look at that maze and solve it for you, right? And it could solve really large maps really fast. 
Well, there's certain algorithms to do that and sets kind of come in handy to figure out, okay, have I been to this spot or not? I have been there before, so I don't need to go back there. Um, and so you keep track of all of the unique spots that you have been to before, rather than just appending it to a list and having to search all the way down that list, it just becomes more efficient to use a set. Now, the sets, you know, you can use them somewhat like um, our list. When we did uh, Goonies in uh, our movies, if I had a set and our sets are used with curly brackets, uh, I had Maryland and I had Georgia and I can say uh, Maryland in set and it, I shouldn't have used the word set you know I accidentally overwrote Python will allow you to do that um, but essentially I can look to see if a state is in there um, and I could look to see if Florida is not in my set right so I can look it up so I'm gonna exit out of Python just so that you know since I overwrote that and we'll just call it that right so let me go back to the slides okay last one is dictionaries and dictionaries just like lists are super useful you'll you'll find that you use them quite a bit and so everything in a dictionary is stored by key value right so whereas in our list we looked everything up with index values what you're really looking up in a dictionary is a key and then you expect to get the value associated with that key back so for instance in a real dictionary we have words and words are our keys and we look up that word and the value we get returned back is the uh is the definition of that word right so if i wanted to look up a word I go to the page where that word exists and I read the definition. Okay, so dictionaries are very similar, but uh, just like with our sets, order is not guaranteed. Uh, although with the newer versions of Python, it looks like they have changed that and order is pretty much guaranteed that the order that you put those keys in is the order they'll stay in. That, that was not true before and so it's it's worth keeping it in the back of your mind that if you're expecting it to be in a specific order be careful right uh now it is optimized for fast lookup it's when you want that key it's going to look it up very quickly um and so it becomes super useful to store things in it and retrieve them right so in my case uh just like in some of our other ones where i created like a list i can use the list function here when i'm creating a dictionary i can also use the dict dict function okay or i can use curly brackets again now you might be saying to yourself hey wait a second didn't we use curly brackets with sets yes we did the difference though is with this little guy right here this little guy right here the colon right here tells python okay this is not a set even though i gave you the curly brackets because you see this colon in here you know it's a dictionary and so this is our key value pair. So the key is Jimmy and the value is 88. The key is Jenny and the value is 92.5. So in our case, we're storing a name and we're associating that name with a value. So for our case, it's grades, right? So Jimmy got an 88 on his test, Jenny got a 92.5. But we create it by starting with this uh, curly bracket here, uh, curly bracket, all right? And our commas separate each of the individual uh, pairs, right? just like we did in our list, just like we did in our tuple, just like we did in our sets, right? But the difference being here is we have this semicolon that is our bridge between our key and our value, okay? And so I can create my dictionary this way. Additionally, if I wanna put more values in it, I could specify grades and then in square brackets, just like we would with our index values, I could specify a new key and then because I'm using the assignment operator, the single equals and putting a number out here, this now becomes the value 
and this is the key. So we should expect that I have keys for Jimmy, Jenny, and Julie at this point, right? Now here, I'm just using the arrow operator. This isn't actually something you type in. I just wanted to indicate this is an output. So if I specify grades and Jenny and just hit enter right there, uh, what I'm going to be returned is the value associated with Jenny. So we see up here, we did have 92.5, so 92.5 gets returned, okay? And then we have fill. Well, fill doesn't exist in our, uh, in our dictionary, and so we get a key error exception. So just like when we used an invalid index value before, if we use an invalid key value, we'll also crash our program, okay? And we'll find there's better ways of looking it up rather than just putting in this and potentially crashing. Instead, we can use a get method. So our get method will look up fill. And if fill is not in there, we essentially just get none as our return, right? Okay, so let's play with this just a little bit. Because again, dictionaries are super useful. And so I don't want you to kind of miss... Uh, miss out on it. Okay, so in our case, we had grades, but let's say we had our uh, a shopping list. <clears throat> so let's say this is our cart. We'll, we'll say we're ordering things online. So we have a cart. Uh, we'll use our, and so cart equals, we'll use our curly brackets and we'll say uh, bread and we'll say colon and we'll say this time, Today, bread is $2.99. We have our comma that separates a new key value pair. And we'll say milk. We'll say milk's on the rise. So it's $3.99. Uh, and then we'll say uh, I wanted to get a pack of chewing gum as well. And it equals uh, 99 cents, right? And so now our cart has bread in it, milk in it, and gum in it as our keys and it has values associated with each of those keys. And so if I wanted to retrieve, what was the price of bread again? I could say, what is in my cart? I could say bread and just hit enter and I get 2.99, okay? Well, maybe while I was waiting, uh, we're down to our last pack of gum, right? And so the price of gum now is going up so I can update the value of this by just assigning a new value to it. And I could say it's now $1.25. Uh, gum is not defined. Oh, I typed gum twice, not cart. So now when I look at my cart, gum is in fact $1.25, right? So I can just overwrite values if I wanted to, okay? Well, just like all of the other objects we looked at, Let's check out what are the various um, various things that I can do with a dictionary. Okay, so let's say this is uh, dir on cart. <clears throat> and so I'll see that there's a couple of them, like the get method I mentioned before. Uh, there's items, keys. I can pop items off of my, um, off of my dictionary. Uh, I can update values. I can retrieve just the values. So a lot of different things that we could kind of dig into, but I'll point out just a few. So we can do cart.keys, all right? So I'm calling the keys method in my cart, in my dictionary. And so what I get back is, notice the square brackets, a list of just the keys, right? So bread, milk, and gum but I can also retrieve the values. So I get a list back of just the values inside my dictionary, all right? And so I can do now lots of things there. Let me think. Uh, I want to know what is the average price of an item in my cart? Well, just like we use the len on some of our other uh, collections, I can use the len on my cart. So I see that I have three items. <coughs> now, um, we know we have three items. Now we need to figure out what is the total price of all the items within our dictionary. Well, there's another function called sum 
that will just automatically add up all the values that you pass to it. And so in this case, I can do a cart dot values and I get back, okay, the total price of all of the things in my cart is $8.23. So now I could, you know, do something like that. So if I hit the up arrow, I can do sum of cart divided by the len of my cart. So the number of items in my cart, and I'll find out the average price is $2.74. Okay. So again, just looking at the, the, DIR output, I can see these various methods. And if I didn't know how to use them, I can use the help, uh, you know, help on them as well to say help on what is cart dot update, man, how would I use that? Well, the update method, uh, let's see, it looks like update D from an iterable E and F if E is present and has keys method then does. Okay. This one I'll have to play with because it's been a little while and being blown up on my screen, it's hard for me to read, you know, what it's actually doing. Um, but essentially, built in dig, dig D from dig iterable E and F. So this one looks a little bit harder to use. I think it's how you can update an entire dictionary. Um, but we'll, you know, I've kind of dug myself into a hole because it's been a while since I used the update method. Um, and so rather than dragging you through a hole, um, we'll, we'll move on, right? But Google is, is there to help you uh, if the documentation isn't quite good enough. Again, it's been a while since I used update. Um, so we'll just, at this point, we'll move on, okay? So again, Super useful dictionaries um, are going to be valuable to you as we as we move forward. Okay, so at the very end, I uh, put out a couple challenges uh, to see you know who was kind of paying attention and if they kind of you know got some of the things. And so the first one was create a list and then add an item to it. Well, that doesn't sound too difficult. If we bring this up, how did we create a list? Well. We could do it with just list like that, All right? So we had maybe my list equals like that. And so when we look at it, it's just an empty list. But I could also just do, oops, square brackets as well, and I get the same thing, okay? So how do I add an item to it? Well, I could have put an item in it at the beginning when I created it right there. But I could also insert into it or I could append to it. So how about my list dot append? We'll append a five to our list. I'll just up arrow and I can see that I now have a five in my list. Okay. And so in the answer or potential answer, because there's always multiple ways of doing things, uh, that's pretty much what I did. Okay, the next one was create a dictionary of items and their prices. So the example we just did, and then print out one of the prices of those items, okay? So what did we have? We had a cart, and so a uh, cart, we just listed an item with a colon and the price of that item. So if I wanted to retrieve just one of those things, I could say, well, what was the price of milk? And it's as easy as that, right? So I just list the key that I want to look up and it returns to me the value associated with that key, okay? So what do we see here? I had bread, milk, and eggs, and then I printed uh, the prices and I used that key value, milk, and I got back 299, right? So 299 got printed to the screen, okay? And this last one was a little bit more advanced, create a list of grades and find the class average. So this is very similar to what we did finding the average price of uh, things in our cart. So now we just have a list of grades. Uh, let's find the average of the class, okay? So instead of using a dictionary, we're using a list this time. We'll say grades equals, we'll use our square brackets, 
we'll say somebody got an 88, somebody got a 95.5, somebody got a 70, and somebody didn't do so well, they got a 65, okay? And so if I do a len on my grades, I could see that I do have four total items. If I do a sum on my grades, I can see that it automatically adds those up for me. So if I do my sum of my grades divided by the len of my grades, I'll see that my class average was 79.625, okay? And so we should see something similar here uh, is just printing out that average. So in this case, you know, I had some grades, uh, I got the sum of the grades divided by the length of the grades. I assigned that to the variable called average, and then I just printed out the average, okay? So again, that's that was pretty much the second meetup. Just wanted you to get used to seeing how we can pull in multiple values into some type of container type. Uh, our list being super useful and our dictionary being super useful. But again, we'll see tuples and we'll see sets as well. Um, but we'll would we'll end up using lists and dictionaries quite a bit. So I hope this was helpful to you. Uh, I invite you to go back and play with some of these concepts um, as you kind of explore Python as a programming language. So thanks for watching and I hope you have a good day. Goodbye.